Welcome to Gameology. My name is James Napoli. I am a paleontologist based at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I study the evolution and development of dinosaurs, especially meat-eating dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. Now let's get into it. Oh, I've always wanted a game where I can build my own museum. I might have to get this one. I've seen a lot of dinosaur museums that look like this, the, you know, the kind of vegetation and the... Oh, wait a minute. So this is extremely, extremely specialized knowledge, and I don't fault the game designers on it too much, but I have to bring it up because I'm pedantic. The sign says that this Triceratops is Triceratops horridus. So the way that it works is that the first name is the genus name, and a genus is a collection of individual species. So the total name is Triceratops horridus. This is the same way that humans are Homo sapiens, the way that a lion is Panthera leo, the way that an alligator is Alligator mississippiensis. There are two species of Triceratops, Triceratops horridus and Triceratops prorsus. And the long nasal horn is actually diagnostic of the species Triceratops prorsus. So this label is the wrong species of Triceratops. Again, this is extremely inside baseball. This is a really, really picky detail here, but given that the sign says a species name, I simply have to comment on it. That said, the museum is, like, otherwise really believable. And I mean, it's also not unbelievable that a museum plaque would have an error on it. There's a number of museums, like the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, that have their dinosaur skeletons displayed in these sorts of vegetated centerpieces that kind of approximate a Cretaceous ecosystem. This is really cool. And ever since I was a kid, I've wanted to completely design my own dinosaur museum. I'm still hopeful I'll eventually have the chance to do that in my life, but until then I might have to get this game and start building my own museum. Yeah, just a nice space, big open gallery. This is not unrealistic at all. The donor wall is the feature of every museum. This looks like it's a Range Rover, which is probably a fancier car than we'd be using for field work. Although that said, we often do rent cars for field work, or we might use a fleet of old vehicles. Generally, we'd be seeing things more like pickup trucks, jeeps. So what they're saying here is that the uh, dinosaur fossils that you're being sent to discover are stuff that were found by miners. It's actually the case that we find a lot of dinosaur fossils just because of people either hiking or digging or mining or doing construction, kind of chancing upon fossil remains. Actually, the way that a lot of early fossils were discovered, they were mostly discovered in like coal mines and limestone mines. And even now in China, there's a lot of construction ongoing with new cities being built. And a lot of times construction crews are digging the foundation for a building and they find a dinosaur skeleton and then it goes to the nearest museum and people get to study it. So this is a pretty common way that a paleontologist might actually find out about a dinosaur fossil that they should excavate. So I've never had to break large piles of rock to keep driving in the field before, but it is true that we deal with a lot of natural barriers. You know, we're not using real roads, we're using dirt roads and things, and it's possible for there to be obstructions that mean we have to take a different route. So this is something that we would not really do because the two ways we'd find a fossil, neither of them would involve using a, like an iPad on a mounted thing to try to locate the bones. Usually we just prospect and we, you know, essentially walk around in the desert until we find remains and dig in the area where we're finding fossils. But if it's a construction site where fossils were found, then the people who did the construction would just tell us where they are and we could dig. This is clearly something for gameplay to make it a little bit more engaging, but it's not something that's strictly realistic. That said, though, keeping track of where fossil material is and making a quarry map, as we call it, which is a like, gridded out map where we record the location of every piece of bone we pull out, it is something pretty important. So the general procedure here of mapping out the quarry before you excavate too much is actually good paleontological practice. And, you know, I also must say, if we had a device we could use to just scan the rock to find out where there would be fossils, our chops would be a lot easier, and we'd probably get through a lot more work more quickly. So now they've mapped out the quarry, there's red flags everywhere. This process in particular is not something that's commonly done with just walking around with a sledgehammer and beating up boulders. But when you do field work, you actually have to remove a lot of rock that is over the layer that the fossils are preserved in. We call that the overburden layer. It's a big part of our field work. It's just essentially removing enough rock that we can access the layer of it. And so this isn't exactly how overburden removal works, but it seems to be kind of right in spirit. 
So the excavation method here is not something that would be that realistic. We don't really use shovels to just dig through soil because the fossils are preserved in solid sedimentary rock. So we're mostly using rock hammers, picks, awls, brushes to remove rubble. Shovels are mostly used when you're removing overburden and you're trying to just like clean up the work site. It's a much finer process than this that involves a lot of like chiseling through the rock, not really just kind of digging like this. This is something you can do through soil. You can't really do it through solid rock. So no tool like this, as far as I know, exists that would just tell you if a nodule of rock has bone in it. There's a lot of digging involved. This is accurate. Sometimes you spend a lot of time just moving through rock material before you ever get to fossils. I mean, generally keeping good track of where the fossil material actually is is probably the most critical thing. Like in general, it's pretty standardized that you want to map the site, you log where you find everything, you keep careful notes on how the material is coming out, you make your quarry maps, you excavate carefully, you generally try to leave a little bit of rock around the bone so that you can safely jacket it in plaster and then remove it from the field. It gets prepared out in the laboratory later, and that's what actually prepares it for study and exhibit. That said, every single fossil site is a unique challenge. They're often located in really difficult to access areas. And so there's not really any such thing as a standardized protocol beyond the very broad strokes of what you have to do. Sometimes you spend an entire summer just removing overburden from a site because it's under so much rock that you can't even access it. Sometimes the material that the fossils are in is really easily broken down and the fossils kind of just pop out. Sometimes you need to use jackhammers and rock saws to remove huge chunks of the cliffside for preparation of the lab later because the bone is either so dense or the rock is so hard that you can't really work it with hand tools. What they're just showing here is a really good part of the fossil hunting process. They are using a plaster jacket to protect the fossil for transport. So the first thing you really need to do as you discover the fossils is you need to put a lot of fixative in. You essentially glue them back together because fossils are so delicate in the field. And so that hard plaster jacket will redirect any stresses or forces that come in contact with the jacket and mean that if the if it knocks against something or if there's a bump in the road or if it gets tossed around during shipping, it's less likely to damage the fossil. So plaster jacketing like that has been done, as far as I know, since the dawn of paleontology. Like that was very quickly realized to be the main way that you could get things back from the field. Modern technology has not changed this process very much, except that we can like use GPS to locate things and we can use jackhammers and rock saws to get through tough material. In the past, they mostly used dynamite. I have the suspicion that a lot of good fossils were destroyed because people were essentially dynamiting entire hillsides and waiting for fossils to pop out. We only really started to find very small dinosaurs and baby dinosaurs in the fossil record when we started excavating much more carefully so that we're not destroying most of the material by blowing up the entire hill looking for fossils. So now we're back in the lab. We have uh, fossil material that hasn't been identified yet because it hasn't been prepared. So you can see we're moving a plaster jacket out of the crate and then we're using this rotary tool to cut through the plaster jacket. And this is one of those first steps you have to take back in the laboratory. We call this opening the jacket or cracking the jacket. It's always a really exciting time because sometimes you find things that are unexpected in there. It's kind of like being a kid on Christmas morning when you're waiting with the preparatory staff while they do this. Fossil preparators are like some of the most important people in paleontology. They do all of this fine work for fossil preparation and conservation, which includes everything from opening the jackets to removing the fossils from the rock, which is what we're seeing here to building specialized housings for them to keep them safe in the collections for the rest of time. It's really, really important. So these reciprocating tools, these air scribes, are really commonly used by fossil preparators. Now I'm not a fossil preparator myself, so if I say something wrong here, one of my close friends is a preparator will probably make fun of me for it on our own YouTube channel later, but that's okay. Generally what you see here is you use an air scribe tool to very carefully remove the rock from the fossils, keeping the fossils glued in the process with the ultimate goal of removing as much rock as possible to allow the fossils to be studied. What they're showing here is that brushes are pretty commonly used to clean the material before final conservation. Brushes are used at every stage. We use them a lot in excavation to keep our work sites clean. We use them during preparation. Just a really important tool. Nothing too glamorous or fancy, just simple paintbrush can do a lot. What the game doesn't show for pretty 
justifiable reasons is that sometimes you actually do want to leave rock associated with the fossils to either hold them together or to hold articulated remains in association with each other. So if you have an entire like limb that's articulated, you might actually leave part of the rock there so that they can stay articulated. It depends on the goals for each individual specimen, whether they're supposed to be displayed or just used for research and their structural integrity, right? There are some fossils you can't remove from the rock at all. They're just too delicate. Prep labs are often a good place for people to volunteer to learn paleontology and like to start to get experience in the field. And so there's often a huge number of volunteers who pass through a prep lab. And because fossils take so long to prepare, sometimes they literally take years. One fossil that I worked on for my PhD literally was under preparation for three decades. If fossils are not conserved properly, they will break down and can break down very quickly. So it is critical for fossils to be housed in like reputable museum collections with preparators on staff who are educated and knowledgeable about how to keep fossils preserved so that they can always be studied and exhibited. Now assembling the skeleton like this is something that would not be done at this stage. That's generally only done if you decide to put it on exhibit. When you're putting a fossil on exhibit, you have to make a really difficult call, which is where you're going to exhibit the real material or you're going to exhibit casts. Casts are exact replicas of the fossil material. They're lighter and less delicate, so they're really good for display because you can put them in all sorts of dramatic poses and you don't have to worry about the real fossil being damaged by visitors or disasters in the halls or anything like that. The difficulty is that, you know, people go to museums that want to see the real thing. They don't want to see a plastic model of it, even if that's an exact replica. And so a lot of museums try to strike a balance of how much they can exhibit real material without putting it at risk or making it inaccessible to researchers like me, and how much they exhibit casts so that they can show really, really cool fossil maps and keep the real material housed somewhere else. You know, this is an area where the preparation process is going to be a lot more involved. Animal skulls are made of like dozens of different bones that have very complex joints with each other. It's rare to find skulls and it's especially rare to find articulated skulls. So it's very possible that this would involve a lot more reconstructive work. It would be a cool thing to add to the game almost as like a difficulty setting if the fossils could be broken and need to be put back together properly by the preparator before they could be exhibited. That's a pretty common thing that they have to do here. But now that the fossil mount is complete, they've got the Ornithomimus skeleton and they're building an exhibit. And, you know, building an exhibit is something that I am really excited to get to do at some point in my career. I haven't gotten to yet. And I've certainly talked with a lot of people who do design exhibits, and there's so many considerations that have to go into it. So, for instance, we now know that grass had evolved by the time that dinosaurs like Ornithomimus lived, but grass wouldn't have been the main ground covering their ecosystem. This wasn't a grassy world like we have today. So showing a grass base to this exhibit here is actually something that's not really that accurate. I can't comment so much on the interior design of the museum, but I do like that this game appears to give you a tremendous amount of control on what your museum actually winds up looking like. That's really fun. I might have to try playing this game at some point. It does look like exactly the kind of thing I would have loved as a kid. And now that I'm a working paleontologist, might love a, a little bit of an embarrassing. It seems like it's something I could sink a lot of time into. If you want to see more of me, you can check out a YouTube channel that I run with some of my colleagues in the field of paleontology. We use video games to talk about scientific concepts. If you want to see more gameology, you can find our other videos on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you next time.